Hello everyone and welcome to video number four in our romp through the history of paleontology in which we're going to be looking at some developments that happened after the establishment of geology as a science with paleontology as a part of that. And these largely coincide with the Victorian era in UK history. So we're talking, into, we're talking about the 1900s. So I wanted to start by introducing just a couple of people who are quite important during this time period. The first of these is William Buckland. This man is an English theologian, a religious man who ultimately became the Dean of Westminster. But alongside his religious roles, he was also a geologist and a paleontologist. He's notable because he wrote the first full account of a dinosaur. He described a specimen of Megalosaurus. And he is well respected um, at, during the time, um, during his lifetime, for work showing that Kirkdale Cave in North Yorkshire was a prehistoric hyena den. In the middle here on this slide, you can see a contemporary illustration of that. He is also fairly famous for naming and pioneering work on coprolites, so that's fossilized poo. So, cool claim to fame. Um, his religious background influenced his work in this area, and he was famous for contributing a thing called the Bridgewater Treatise. The cover of one of these is shown on the right-hand side here, which was one of the first, sorry, one of the last attempts within the establishment of the church and the scientific um, community to try and meld those two worldviews together. So, was quite important at the time. Moving on, I wanted to also introduce uh, a gentleman that I actually mentioned in the last set of videos called Charles Lyell, shown on the left-hand side here. This handsome gentleman with the fantastic bow tie was a British lawyer, but is also one of the best-known geologists of the Victorian era. Whilst he wasn't directly involved in the formation of paleontology as a field, his work was still quite important because it popularised Hutton's concept of uniformitarianism that I've mentioned previously. This was at a time when Cuvier's catastrophism was more prominent. He did so by arguing that, for example, volcanoes, as shown in one of his diagrams on the right-hand side here, um, were the result of gradual um, processes and volcanoes built up gradually. And he also identified the causes of earthquakes. All of this opened the door for slow moving forces that are still in operation today to have acted over a very long period of time to create the geology that we see today. This, in turn, helped promote the idea of a very ancient Earth, um, directly in opposition to the ideas of catastrophism, and um, formed a framework for paleontological thought in decades to come. That viewpoint also influenced prominent thinkers in the world of life sciences, such as Charles Darwin. But this was also a kind of a very fractious period where lots of people were having beef and fights with each other as the, the building blocks of what we consider geology today were put into place. And a really good example of this is the order vision controversy. And this was an argument between the two reprobates shown on this slide here. So on the left-hand side, you can see Adam Sedgwick. This man was the son of a vicar, and he went on in his life to become the Woodwardian Professor of Geology at the University of Cambridge. Even then, a very old, well-respected and learned institution. As a, um, a person, he was a very conservative member of the Church of England, and he didn't, for example, buy the concept of evolution, despite being a tutor and a friend of Charles Darwin. He was notable in the construction of the geological column for proposing the Cambrian and the Devonian periods. In contrast, Roderick M.P. Murchison, shown in the middle here, was a Scottish geologist, and he is known for first describing and investigating rocks from the Silurian time period. And indeed, the two presented a joint paper based on fieldwork in Wales in 1835 called on the Silurian and Cambrian systems, exhibiting the order in which the older sedimentary strata succeed each other in England and Wales. Snappy title, isn't it? Um, but this, in turn, led to this argument that I've mentioned. So Sedgwick's upper Cambrian period overlapped with the lower part of Murchison's Silurian period. Sedgwick used 
rocks to define his Cambrian period, whereas Murchison used fossils to do the, uh, to the definition of his time period. And what could be viewed as a quarrel over semantics, so something that's not really that important on the scale of things, between these two men left them permanently estranged and the scientific community took years to resolve this problem. The, in fact, the solution was only really worked out in 1879 when one of Cedric's um, colleagues, Charles Lapworth, I've mentioned on the far right-hand side here, um, who was later a famous professor of geology at Birmingham, introduced a third time period, the Ordovician. So that's where the Ordovician, known for these fantastic fish on the, the right-hand side here, was first named. And all that was was um, the, the time period between the disputed Upper Cambrian and Lower Silurian um, periods of Cedric and Murchison. He just took that overlapping bit and said, guys, we're going to call this the Ordovician. This happened a lot. Um, this guy Murchison had other run-ins with famous geologists, such as a gentleman called um, Della Beche, regarding the Devonian and the Carboniferous. So it was a time period where we were building the geological column, but people were arguing with each other an awful lot over, um, over these things. And often I, I kind of feel reading about it that it was driven a lot by egos. The other person that I've mentioned on the slide is John Phillips. This man was an English geologist who published in 1841 the first global geological timescale based on the correlation of fossils in rock strata. Um, he went a long way to standardizing um, the basic terminology that we still use today. For example, he invented the term Mesozoic for the um, Triassic, Jurassic, and Cretaceous time periods, which um, uh, we, is something that we still use today. Another really important um, character, actor in this story, but another example of um, kind of someone that was very prone to these arguments was Richard Owen, who's shown on the left-hand side in a photograph here and in a contemporary cartoon in the middle here. He was interesting because he was born in Lancaster to a poor family, and he was considered both lazy and impudent at school. He dropped out of, a career, uh, of his training in medicine and ended up studying anatomy. He moved to London and became a lecturer in comparative anatomy after meeting Georges Cuvier. He is, in fact, responsible for bringing comparative anatomy to the UK. He defined, for example, the concept of homology, the idea that, for example, our arms, sorry, just looking for the camera there, um, are the same structures in terms of... Um, uh, of their origins as a bat's wings and a bird's wings. They are the forelimbs of a tetrapod, say. And he extended this to recognize a common structural pattern for, or structural plan, I should say, across all vertebrates. He examined reptile-like fossils from the southeast of the UK and concluded that the bones of Iguanodon, Megalosaurus, and uh, other um, organisms that we now recognize to be uh, members of a common group were not just lizards, but they actually were members of their own group. And in 1842, he called this group the Dinosauria, or the Dinosaurs. He founded also the Natural History Museum in London, which is still going strong today. Here it is from a conference dinner that I went to. Um, and he insisted, which was quite revolutionary at the time, that it should be free and it should be accessible to all people. So, well done, Richard Owen. Okay, and it may seem, if I left it there, like he's just a good guy. Didn't he do well? However, he is also legendary for being vain, arrogant, envious, and vindictive. He was not a nice person. And a good example of this is his relationship with a contemporary of his, a guy called Gideon Mantel. Here is Mantel, shown on the left-hand side here. This man was an English obstetrician, so he was a, um, a medical man by training, but he was also a geologist and a paleontologist. He was born in Sussex and jumped around schools during his education as he was a Methodist, so he was a, not a member of the Church of England, so couldn't go to his local grammar school. Once more, religion seems to be impacting on people's education quite a lot in this time period. He worked as a doctor, but in his spare time, he collected fossils in Sussex, largely from the Cretaceous chalk downlands that cover this county. Mantel, or his wife, it's not quite clear which from the record, found some teeth, and despite the fact he was mocked for this viewpoint by the scientific community, 
Um, he maintained that these teeth were like those of an iguana, like a lizard, but they were bigger. Um, and he was orig eventually proved right. So this plays into this story of the origin and the recognition that the dinosaurs are an extinct group of things that are not alive today. You can see some of these um, teeth on the right-hand side of this slide. But he wasn't particularly successful in terms of his economics. By 1838, he was financially destitute. He had a horrendous coach accident in 1841, which left him in constant pain with a spine injury. And then, when he uh, dropped out of kind of the public consciousness, Richard Owen claimed Iguanodon was his own discovery, and indeed he did do, did do some of the early descriptions of this taxon. Um, and when Mantel was injured and uh, wasn't around anymore, Owen renamed several dinosaurs that Mantel had already um, talked about in scientific literature to claim as his own. When Mantel then died of an opium overdose in 1852 that was brought around by dealing with the pain of his, his injuries, um, Richard Owen had his spine cut out and pickled, and they're stored on a shelf in the Royal College of Surgeons. You can see that spine here. His anonymous obituary, that we all think was probably rich, written by um, Richard Owen, said that um, Mantell was little more than a mediocre scientist who brought forth few notable contributions. So um, Richard Owen had both the final um, words about Mantell and indeed um, looked after some of his remains. It, it's kind of like a really um, interesting, uh, I guess, illustration of the kind of gentleman that Richard Owen was and how unforgiving Vict Victorian society was, even to, to those who were in relatively respected professions, such as doctors. A really good um, illustration of just how famous and important um, paleontology became as a field in the Victorian era is the Great Exhibition of 1851. You can see some, um, uh, some illustrations from this very famous event on this slide here. So essentially what happened is that Queen Victoria's husband, Prince Albert, um, decided that England and Britain more generally should host a great exhibition to show the fruits of their empire, to show that they are indeed top of the world. And this was a, a massive event that occurred in the year of 1851. A crystal palace, so-called, because it used so much glass and steel, was built in um, South Kensington now, I think, in, in London. And it went on to house this great exhibition before, a few years later, being moved to Crystal Palace in London, hence the name Crystal Palace. Um, and it's a really good example of the impact that this new science of paleontology has had on society because there were a se series of, um, of uh, sculptures, is the word I'm looking for, of dinosaurs that were designed by a famous architect called Benjamin Waterhouse Hawkins under the scientific direction of Sir Richard Owen. And you can see some contemporary illustrations of these dinosaurs um, here. These were actually created for the move of Crystal Palace to um, what is now Crystal Palace in 1853. Um, and these were created because dinosaurs had really captured the public imagination of this time. When it came to creating an exhibit that everyone would want to see when they went to visit the Crystal Palace, these dinosaurs were where it was at. And that was because dinosaurs were suddenly um, a major part of the public consciousness, even for the poor in this time period. There was actually a famous banquet that was held in the mold of one of these dinosaurs, the Crystal Palace Iguanodon, on New Year's Eve in 1853 that's shown on the right-hand side here with a number of the famous players that we've met already during this time period in attendance. So there you go. By the 1850s, uh, paleontology had established itself as a science, and in fact, it was about as cool as it's ever been. I hate to inform you that people don't really think we're that cool anymore. During the 19th century, um, there was a rush of, um, especially during the later 19th century, of vertebrate paleontology work in Europe um, and North America. And rich bone beds in North America were discovered in Colorado, Nebraska, and Wyoming. 
This then lead, led to a heated rivalry between the two gentlemen that are shown on this slide that was dubbed the Bone Wars or the Great Dinosaur Rush. This was between Edward Drinker Cope and Othniel Charles Marsh. So uh, Charles Marsh is this dude here. Drinker Cope is this dude with a mis jaunty moustache here. Both of these gentlemen had really strong personalities and they fell out towards the end of the 1860s. From 1872 to 1892, both went on large expeditions to collect vertebrate fossils. They used their funds and influence to acquire fossils by any means, whether those were moral or otherwise. In a game of one-upmanship, between them they established over 140 new species of dinosaur. All the while, whilst they were trying to discredit each other, they had publicly aired grievances and arguments in a series of letters to, new paper, to newspapers, including the New York Herald. In these, Cope accused Marshall of financial mismanagement and plagiarism. Marsh responded by accusing Cope of slander, branding him a liar and a thief. It was a colourful episode in the history of paleontology, arguably between a couple of douchebags. Just my opinion there for you. Um, but it left an enduring scientific legacy. Their finds included, for example, Triceratops, Allosaurus, Diplodocus, and Stegosaurus, all famous dinosaurs that we still um, talk about today. A key consideration during this time period was how old the Earth actually was. And a, a famous person who contributed to this um, debate was uh, Lord Kelvin, shown on this slide here. He was born in 1824 in Belfast and was an Irish mathematical physicist and engineer. His father was a maths professor and Kelvin started university at the age of 10. Um, he stayed at Glasgow for most of his working life, turning down many eminent appointments. He's known for many things, including his formulation of the first and second laws of thermodynamics, introduction of the concept of an electromagnetic field with Faraday, and he was the scientific adv advisor when we laid the first um, telegraph cables across the Atlantic. But he was also notable for investigating the Earth's cooling, so it started off as a hot ball and then it's cooled over time. And um, this uh, served as a vehicle by which he made historical inferences about the age of the Earth using cooling calculations. And doing this, he posited that the Earth had once been too hot to support life, contrary to the strict idea of uniformitarianism, and by making this assumption then, working out how long it would take a body to cool, by 1897 he had settled on an estimate for the age of the Earth of between 20 to 40 million years old. Now we know now, now that he's really quite, quite far out in that, right? We know now radioactivity exists and the Earth has been kept warmer than we would otherwise expect by the gradual decay of radioactive elements. But, um, nevertheless, um, that gave us this idea of a very old Earth over which evolution, etc., and the, the laws of geology could um, play out. And that set um, further allowed many ideas of uniformitarianism, in except not in incredibly strict ways, to, to, to be accepted as fact. So that's all been very UK-centric. Elsewhere in Europe, there were things that were going on that um, also were important in the development of paleontology. So on this slide, you can see uh, Jean Agassiz, a Swiss-born biologist and geologist. This is a guy that studied with Cuvier for a while. And then he settled as a professor of natural history at a university in Switzerland before emigrating to the US in 1847. His major contribution um, really to the field of paleontology was a study of fossil fish, an example of one of his, his illustrations next to his fantastic mug. It's shown on this slide here. He also studied geology and was the first person to suggest that the Earth had been through ice ages in the past. He was the only person um, to name a species after Mary Anning during her lifetime, Waldon Jean. But as ever, life is complex, and later in his life, he wrote about scientific racism um, and this is obviously um, really problematic. So take that for what it's worth. Um, 
the world is a complex place. This is also notable as a time period where women um, started to contribute within the scientific hierarchy. Um, later in this period, women started to be accepted as scientists themselves into um, the structures by which people um, communicate science. A really good example of this is Dorothea Bate, that's shown on this slide on the left-hand side here. She was a pioneer of archaeozoology, the study of animal bones from archaeological sites. She worked extensively on um, cave sites. She used animal bones in order to deduce dates, climate, and the environment of sites of interest. And I think, and I include her, because I think she's awesome for a number of reasons. She had a little formal education, and she has commented on the record that her education was o only um, briefly interrupted by school. Sounds cool to me. In 1898, as a late teen, she got a menial job at the Natural History Museum and worked her way up, learning her field as she went. She managed to fund field work using a grant from the Royal Society, which I mentioned previously in these videos, at a time when women were not actually permitted to join the Royal Society still. The image in the middle here shows her um, excavating a dwarf hippopotamus from Cyprus field, field work, which she reconstructed for display at the Natural History Museum in London. And she remained an unofficial worker at the Natural History Museum until 1948, sorry, way beyond retirement age, when she was nearly 70, when she was given her first senior managerial role, finally um, breaking into the official hierarchy of the museum. So well done, Dorothy B. H. She's really, really awesome. Another person I should mention, given her Manchester connections, because we're um, recording this in University of Manchester, is a British author by the name of Mary Stopes. She was a paleobotanist, and she was also a campaigner for women's rights. More of that in a tiny bit. Late, in a tiny bit. She attended um, the University College of London uh, as a scholarship student, and um, she got a first... Um, degree, so she got a degree in two years um, in both botany and geology by attending both day and night schools. She then got a PhD in paleobotany in 1904 in the University of Munich. She then became a lecturer in paleobotany at the University of Manchester between 1904 and 1907. During this time period, she is shown on the left hand side here. She was the first female academic at the University of Manchester. She studied coal, coal balls, seed ferns, and made contributions uh, to knowledge of the earliest angiosperms, that's flowering plants. Um, and indeed, her coal classification scheme is still used by many people today. But she had less and less time to publish as the years went on, because she was actively campaigning more and more as she got older for women's reproductive rights. She opened the first birth control clinic in Britain, and wrote an early sex manual called Marry Love, or Love in Marriage, shown on the right-hand side here, which was a very long way ahead of her time. And indeed, she was a pioneer in many ways for women's rights, which makes her quite notable as um, a paleobotanist and as uh, through her contributions to society. So these are the two things that go hand in hand. She did many laudable, laudable things. But we also have to note when we say that, that part of the reason that she was really big on reproductive rights, because she was also a strong advocate of eugenics. This is a set of beliefs and practices that aims at Im improving the genetic quality of the human population that we now consider to be really very problematic. So once more, um, as with several people that we've met over the course of these videos, she's got this, I'm going to say, checkered legacy. of She did many good things, but some of those were inspired by, th um, or had inspiration that we think is very problematic today. So um, it's a complicated situation. And I'll, I'll end this video there, and I'll see you for the final video, video number five, when we look at more recent history of paleontology in just a few minutes. See you around. <laughs>